thank you all come for coming back after lunch um it's never guaranteed huh so but it's uh, pleased to have you here with us um for this session which we've described as digital for a successful europe um, in this session, obviously, as we have in previous sessions, we're being, you know, it's being live streamed. Uh, those of you on live stream, welcome. Those of you on Zoom, also welcome. You can use hashtag State of EU uh, uh, to join uh, the discussion and raise your questions. I have uh, again a uh, a trusty co collaborator, that's Joe Litobeski over there, who's going to be looking after our Zoom and our online audiences uh, to make sure that they are included fully in this discussion, um, and also. As, as ever, please feel free for those of you who are here uh, live um, to just raise your hand or just you know put your button on and I'll be able to bring you in accordingly. Um, it gives me great pleasure uh, to bring attention again to this document which I raised in the opening plenary. And really this, whilst this conversation um, is intimately about that big driver that I referred to, that mega trend of digitalization, which will fundamentally, whether we like it or not, shape and redraw our lives, our societies, and our global, global community. It will fundamentally determine how we live, work, uh, consume, uh, create community, uh, and everything else in between. Um, it, it's a reality, but it's about how we manage that uh, development, uh, keep up to pace with it and are able to respond to it intelligently based on learning from the past, hopefully, um, not given notwithstanding politics and politicians, obviously, uh, in terms of driving this agenda in the right way, because as you all know, digitalization can be a force for absolute good, uh, uh, but it can be a force for absolute bad. And it's about making sure that we create the right pathway for digitalization to be what it was originally intended to be, was to serve uh, democracy, community, our world, and to be able to help respond to challenges that we face. So without further ado, what I'd first like to do is hand over to our senior fellow who's been uh, accompanying the process of this program called Connected Europe, which we have been in partnership with Vodafone over the past 12 months, a unique, a different partnership for us to really think differently about how we craft policy solutions. And we have tried to put our, you know, where we've tried to advise governments and others to say, take a citizen first approach. We've done that too as a think tank. So over to you, Lindsay, uh, a very warm welcome to, and thank you for launching this excellent report. Thank you, Don Mendera, and thank you to Friends of Europe um, for having me today and for inviting me to say a few words as we launch the Connected Europe report. So welcome, everyone. My name is Lindsay nefesh Clark. I'm the founder of W4.org. It's a social enterprise that works to promote girls and women's digital inclusion, equality, and leadership, and close the digital gender divide. I'm a Friends of Europe European Young Leader, and I've had the honor of participating as a senior fellow in Connected Europe, the initiative that Friends of Europe started about a year ago in partnership with Vodafone to explore how policymakers, industry, and indeed all sectors can work better together to build a successful, green, resilient Europe. Against the backdrop of the global pandemic and the multiple crises, health, educational, economic, environmental, that we're still dealing with, this initiative is not just timely, it's urgent. Europe's recovery, the continent's chance to build back better, and our resilience in the face of future challenges all depend, of course, on how we navigate the digital transition. As unprecedentedly high levels of funding pour into digitalization and the mitigation of the climate emergency, notably through the multi-billion recovery and resilience facility, we need effective policies and strategies in place to use those investments optimally, impactfully, and accountably. A core strength of Connected Europe is its citizen-centric methodology. Uh, we consulted over 300 citizens from across 16 European countries, 
and brought citizens, experts, and policymakers together in a series of debates and working groups to dig deep into the critical issues and crowdsource sol solutions. And we asked the question, what policies must be in place and which concrete actions do we need to take? Indeed, a key premise of the report is that the societal transformation required to foster a successful, green, resilient Europe depends precisely on broad-based support, mobilizing citizens to be part of a paradigm shift. Focus group participants said they want Made in Europe to stand for fairness, quality, affordability, and sustainability. Our report argues that we have an opportunity to strengthen Europe's digital brand built on these values. So I'll briefly touch on the report's main insights. Number one, there must be only one transition for Europe's future, a green digital transition. Action and cooperation must be based on green and digital policy, strategies, and initiatives that are aligned and integrated. Number two, no one can be left behind. The EU and national governments must close regional infrastructure gaps and invest in enabling technologies that can boost business and improve citizens' lives across the board. Citizens must be equipped with digital skills fit for the digital age, with mechanisms to enable them to make informed lifestyle and consumer decisions. Three, the value of data is critical to build Europe's digital brand. Europe must progress swiftly towards a data, data economy, unleashing the benefits while ensuring a regulatory framework that protects businesses and citizens. And finally, four, we need to improve trust in digital. In addition to equipping citizens with skills to safely and securely navigate the digital space, the EU and governments in Europe must implement regulatory frameworks and instruments to improve citizens' trust in digital and protect citizens' rights, including their digital rights. Of course, these are all very tough challenges, but as the report argues, we can work together to boost Europe's connectivity and drive a transformation that is inclusive, sustainable, and fair. Many ambitious programs and initiatives are underway in Europe at the level of the EU, national governments, and involving cross-border, cross-sector alliances. With the right policies and strategies in place and through bold action, we can strengthen Europe's digital brand. The Connected Europe report distills all pa participants' values, ideas, and insights the work over the last 12 months into actionable policy recommendations. And I trust and hope that you'll all read the report and circulate it far and wide. And in this session, Digital for a Successful Europe, our distinguished panelists, speakers, will be discussing some of the critical issues addressed in the report. Um, by no means exhaustive, the Connected Europe report is intended to inform effective policy, and we hope inspire bold action and galvanize a collective commitment to build back better. So thank you for listening. Lizzie, thank you so much. An excellent summation of those key messages. <laughs> and, you know, just a word that, you know, the, those four key insights that you have uh, been plastered all on the screens. And some of you might be thinking, oh, yeah, really, that's really simple. But, you know, in the world that we live in, there's a tendency to over um, bureaucratize or think very smartly about recommendations when actually there's a simplicity 
of the solutions that are available to us. It's just simply structures, bureaucracy and leadership that, uh, that, that stop us in the way. So I please do not take away from those as being, you know, like, my goodness, that they're so straightforward. They are so, so straightforward because, they're, because behind each of one of those, there's a massive bureaucracy, a massive leadership, a massive community movement that needs to be mobilized if we're to get that right. So um, I want to and thank you again. Um, and what I want to do is I want to bring in two contributors first, uh, a, um, a perspective from a funder at the European Investment Bank. And then I want to move to Spain to give a Spanish uh, government perspective uh, on the issue. So first, I'd like to warmly welcome Laura from the European Investment Bank. Hopefully the technology will work and I'll have you online very quickly. Hello, do you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, but I can't see you. Ah, I can, it's because I've got my back to you. Hello, thank you again for joining us, Laura. It's really uh, good to have you with us. And, um, and I, you know, I know from our con a brief conversation, you've read the report as well. Uh, uh, so that's very good to know. Laura, from your from your perspective uh, and experience, what role can the EIB's funding, but also its soft capital, play in harnessing digitalization to contribute towards a, an infrastructure that is able to respond to the twin digital, or what we are calling the green digital transition? Laura, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And indeed, uh, um, uh, I think I want to start by also saying that your initial remarks were indeed uh, uh, and, and also the general uh, uh, results of the report are very, uh, very interesting and very true in their simplicity, in fact. But it, we do fully recognize also at VAB uh, on one hand that digital technologies can play a significant role in growth, sustainability and inclusiveness. But we also are fully aware of the significant gaps that Europe has to fill in order to profit from these opportunities. So, and the COVID crisis, by uh, you know, putting all under a lens and emphasizing all these, has clearly exposed both the opportunities that we have all directly seen with our own eyes, and, but also the, the vulnerabilities and the gaps. And I can see two areas of underinvestment. The first one is digital infrastructure, and the second is indeed the adoption of digital technologies by both the private and the public sector. So, I mean, from your, 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 your question, then I will start focusing on the gap on digital infrastructure. Mm. Uh, so we conducted a study in 2019 on uh, what are the required investments and what is the investment gap to reach the objectives of European gigabit societies by 2025, which means covering all households in urban and rural areas uh, with um, uh, very high speed uh, uh, connectivity networks, as well as all urban areas and transport hubs with 5G. The investment gaps that we have estimated amounts to uh, approximately 250 billion euros. This was in 2019. The situation is not better now. We all know that there have been rollout delays during the COVID crisis, and there are still underinvestment, clear underinvestment in this sector, uh, which due to the crisis will be even more difficult to, um, uh, to gap. And this burden we expect specific, especially on market failure areas, areas which are scarcely populated, rural regions where the private investors are reluctant to invest due to the high unit cost and the lower returns. And this is one of the focus areas of our intervention. The EAB is the largest institution of Europe digital infrastructure. We have an annual lending in this area of 2.5 billion, and we have been supporting rollout of fiber projects, capacity upgrades, and coverage expansion of advanced mobile networks. And this is the area we expect to continue to cover going forward, focusing indeed on bridging this gap in terms of investment to European gigabit societies, but with a focus particularly in the areas where uh, there are higher market failure, with the objectives of making sure that the benefits of digitalization are both geographically and socially inclusive, covering all the population and not leaving anyone behind, as indeed was mentioned in the report. 
Lara, sorry, there's a bit of, our technology is such that there's a bit of a delay between when you speak and what we hear. So that's why I was like, I was looking at you as if like I was confused. I was just making sure you had finished your sentence. Um, Lara, if I may press you, uh, and thank you for making that point. And it's quite interesting what you talk about the investment gap. I thought it would be more, but it's, it's, it's interesting it is, it is where it is at. Um, can you touch upon this digital, digital single market? We know we've had, we've been at this you know roundtable many many years where it, there's a kind of sense that the the single market is a faux notion. It doesn't actually work. Uh, and from pri the private sector perspective, most companies have to cookie cut their approach and actually operate from different member states in order to deliver it. What role can you play as as an EIB, as an investor, as as a funder, to improve or make sure we learn from the single market, but make sure the digital single marketplace works and enables companies to be globally competitive? Tough question, I know. Thank yes, no, thank you. Um, well, on the in gap in infrastructure, maybe to clarify, it's the gap between what private investors are, are willing and planning to roll out and what are the objectives right. of the gigabit society. So it's not what it's missing in terms of investment, but what we don't, there are no funding at the moment. So that's why you, you see it's smaller than you, what you may have a thought of the overall gap. Um, so I was talking about the two gaps, no? one on digital infrastructure and one on the adoption of digital technologies. And this goes very much towards what you are asking me now. And uh, again, you know, we conduct a nearly investment survey with uh, European firms of different size. And it's clear from the results of this service that there is a, a lack uh, in also in the adoption of digital technologies with the fragmentation of the market being one of the key reasons behind it. There is also large disparities in digitization between regions. So, um, and, and this is, uh, you know, the key question here is, uh, can we catch up and what role in fact also financing can play in supporting this catch up? In my view, a key aspect of the mission critical requirements for future business success in Europe is that we need to understand this technology, artificial intelligence, uh, Internet of Things, blockchain, quantum computing, develop expertise in them, but also and fundamentally deploy them at scale by leveraging on those industries where Europe is a global leader, for example, uh, machinery, robotics, automotive industries, the industries will have a substantial benefit from adopting digital technologies and will also have a pull uh, effect on their global uh, supply chains and on SMEs in particular. Additional, European industry is strong in certain digital sectors like electronics for automotive, security and energy markets, telecom equipment, business software, laser and sensor technologies. Here as well, we have estimated an investment gap in the digital transformation. And probably you will say again, this is too small <laughs> because the perception we have is that the gap is really huge. But we have estimated at some 125 billion per year. And this is an area where we have been stepping up our support and we can do more going forward, uh, putting into use our expertise and capabilities but also our broad range of products, because indeed uh, the EB as a group starts from supporting with equity, guarantees and, and debt. And in particular, looking at the growth uh, and fast growing innovative companies, we have developed uh, uh, with the cooperation with the European Commission, a venture debt product, where, which is addressing the gap between the equity market, so venture capital financing, and indeed uh, the longer term debt. Great, thank you. I, I think the, uh, the, the, there's still the outstanding issue about how to make more effective the digital single market list, but I'm not gonna press you upon that uh, further, but I'm sure it'll come out in the conversation around, around this table and through the, the virtual groupings. Um, I'm gonna move on, thank you for that, but you know, obviously I'll bring you back in and I'm sure there'll be questions to you about the role of the EIB in that, in that respect. I want to um, um, now invite Salvador. Salvador from Spain. Hi. Hello. Hi everyone. Oh, Good afternoon. Good afternoon. A warm welcome hearing? to you. We have just a slight gap and delay in getting you back on. 
Okay, but uh, there you go. Last... Wonderful. We can see you. Okay, perfect. Thank you for joining us. Um, you've just been listening, obviously, to uh, our, um, Laura from the EIB, and you know we're talking money here. Um, give, can you sh tell, share with us how how is Spain? How are you planning to, and this is an overly used word, strategically use the RFF monies to actually you know, genuinely add value? to the green digital transition in Spain, but also improve social mobility. Big question, I know you're not the politician, but you are you know, in the mm -hmm. game at a senior level in government. So um, please, would you share with us how you're doing this? How you're planning First of all, thank you. Uh, I would like to start by thanking for, for having me today in this event. Well, it said that to solve the, the future, we, we must embrace the present, working today in the challenges of tomorrow, we will make them easier to face. To do so, cooperation between countries is essential uh, to share common views or, or to reach uh, collaboration agreements on issues such as artificial intelligence, cyber security, digital, digital rights. This meeting is a clear example of collaboration among countries, among uh, uh, sectors, showing a common goal to support a green and a digital economy. In Spain, we have no doubt that uh, digital transformation is a challenge today and for the years to come. In that sense, the recovery, transformation and resilience plan is our national roadmap for the modernization of the Spanish economy. Almost a third of uh, the total of U the European recovery funds will be devoted to enable the digital transformation. Because the digitalization represents a fundamental element to achieve this robust, inclusive and resilient economy of recover uh, recovery after the COVID-19. Uh, the pandemic has uh, accelerated the process of this digitalization, highlighting its strengths as well as its weaknesses, uh, such as digital gaps, uh, which has been mentioned before. And governments need to respond to this challenge. In the case of the European Union and Spain, we have to promote a digital and sustainable economy as the base of the recovery. And that's the plan with the European recovery and resilience mechanism. If we focus on, on Spain, on the Spanish situation, we are initiating a way of understanding the new digital era in a broad, in a, an ambitious sense with initiatives that are already underway with the deployment uh, of our agenda, which is called España Digital 2025, Digital Spain 2025. The roadmap for the digitalization strategy is already a, a reality here with social impact and our economy and in our economy, but also on, on our society. The challenge we face is approach based on a long-term vision uh, with two main axes, digital transformation on one side, ecological transition on the other. Two key processes for the transversal reform of the structures of our product, uh, production model. Two complementary elements capable of generating synergies that will boost our competitiveness at a global level. And in this context, we must not forget that the digital transformation is a bridge towards sustainability. It's an essential tool to gain competitiveness, obviously, and to promote economic growth, obviously. However, digitalization is also a driver for sustainability, both in a socioeconomic and an, an environmental aspect. Thus, this digital transformation must be respect, uh, respectful with the environment and sustainable so that it can contribute to fighting climate change and also to close these digital gaps I, I mentioned before. With the European Recovery Funds, we have a guarantee for this ambition project and with the responsibility and commitment, we we will be taking the right steps towards the sustainable and digital economy that we want uh, and we have the opportunity to build. Summarizing, 
we want to make digitalization the key element for the development of a new production model in Spain based on, on a humanistic digital transformation. Since digitalization has an enormous potential for transformation from a technological, economic, and also environmental and social point of view. Salvador, thank you for that. Um, I won't press you on detail because those were very fine words, uh, but I didn't get a sense of the specifics of what you're going to do to improve social mobility um, or the actual bits of uh, programme expenditure, the big programme expenditure nationally that you're going to tackle um, over time. Perhaps you can share with us uh, in due course. One of the recommendations that in, in our Connected Europe report is that relates to you know the, the power of data and for data to drive both um, uh, business and social value and social good. Um, what would convince Spain, what would convince Spain to participate on an EU-wide platform that enables better data sharing that can improve our response to public health, crisis in the future, but generally a whole range of other areas uh, that we would, could be supported effectively by having such a platform uh, and would really give rise to a different kind of digital Europe. What would convince Spain? We are all, all uh, we are already aligned in this type of projects and in initiatives. Uh, digital sovereignty allows us to to set the rules of the digital economy and society aligned with the European values and rules. So we are all in. In this regard, the European Commission is preparing the way with ambitious legislative proposals on AI, EID, digital services, cybersecurity, data. Value of data is critical. It's been said a few minutes ago, which I agree with. Uh, particularly, data sovereignty is the key catalyst uh, of a, tru a truly digital sovereignty. The individuals and companies should be able to decide to whom they make available the data they produce uh, and under what conditions they do so. And if they want to store it on European soil, the creation of, uh, uh, of data spaces will ensure the implementation of this, of this vision, of this view for sure. Data spaces require, on one hand, a legal and a policy framework that ensures trust in data sharing and, on, on the other hand, a technical infrastructure that operates the sharing in, in, share, in security and in, in privacy. For instance, initiatives like GAGEX uh, play uh, or will play a fundamental role in the development of common European data spaces and a sovereign data sharing architecture. Ar architecture. Spain has joined this initiative and will become part of this governmental advisory board towards the end of the year. So we are in. And we call on the future hub to lead the creation of common data spaces for tourism and health in, at the European level, and to work on data spaces on mobility, agri-food, or e-commerce that will become the basis for the lighthouse, uh, lighthouse projects envisaged in our Digital Spain 2025, which I'll put some detail on afterwards, if we may. The hub should be open to work on any data space that a a stakeholders would like to create, from renewable uh, energies to industry 4.0, while ensuring they are interoperable, secure, and privacy oriented. Okay, thank you. I just hope it doesn't take uh, forever and a day to get to the point where uh, member states are able to share health data uh, effectively and efficiently at a press of a button without being concerned about privacy in, this, in, in that sense because of what we've just experienced, but also other types of employability, uh, certification, and so on and so forth. We have the technology, it's just the trust in each other that's missing to a certain extent, uh, but let's hope we can improve on that. Um, thank you both, and please you know, stay online because I will bring you back in. I want to now bring in a citizen perspective. My colleague, Joe, Joe can I hand over to you to um, give voice to the citizens, if you like, uh, as you know, we started this entire initiative with citizens. Over to you, Joe. Thank you, Damandra. Yes, no, citizen engagement um, was very important for us. Uh, we, we really saw this as 
uh, being part of this kind of wave of, of deliberative and participatory democracy, which is kind of washing over uh, Europe at the moment. It's obviously, this report took place in the context of the Conference on the Future of Europe, and there's also been a, a push towards involving citizens more in policymaking at all levels of government, from local to national to European, through citizens' assemblies, through uh, citizens' panels and juries, and other deliberative and participatory um, tools. So that was really important for us that the citizen get like the the, the citizen input began the process. Um, and that we responded to the concerns and the hopes of citizens when it comes to digitalization. So we're going to watch a video extract now from our focus group series, um, which gives you a kind of flavor of some of the, the language used. Um, and the issue of fairness came up. Uh, it's in two of these clips, but it came up again and again during the focus groups, as well as there's a, there's a comment from a younger participant about how digital helped her stay connected during lockdown. And when I ran focus groups with young participants, this is again something that came up again. I heard uh, um, di uh, digital is a lifesaver. I wouldn't have been able to, to, to stay in touch with people if it hadn't been for digital. These sort of extracts and these, these kind of comments from citizens are in the report. If you read the report, you'll see them sort of peppered throughout. And the working groups that we, we um, convened responded to some of these these kind of concerns and hopes because the, the idea is really if we are going to navigate the green digital transition it has to be done in dialogue with citizens with other stakeholders it, it cannot be done in, with a, in a top-down approach so let's watch the the video um, as I said it just gives you a, a kind of flavor there's more extracts in the report itself which I hope everyone will read um, and maybe we can we can just see some uh, some of these these clips it's extremely unfair to leave a considerable percentage of the population out of the world. Out of the world, not just because of the skills that they don't have, but also because they don't have the means. They don't have uh, laptops, they don't have uh, probably the smartphones and so on. But uh, in many cases, particularly in rural areas, remote areas, uh, in the mountains, in rocky areas, there's not even signal. It's like... 24 seven, I'm like in love with my computer <laughs> because I spend, I just spend all of my days uh, in front of my computer. I'm, I'm actively volunteering in the meantime, which is helping me a lot also to socialize. And I, yeah, I, I spend a lot, a lot of hours in front of the computer, either talking to people or like working on different things. Uh, but yeah, without it, I would be very lost, I think. So digitalization needs to be a thing that needs to be pushed by the EU, uh, needs to be brought on the way. We need to have good internet connections everywhere in, in Europe. Um, you know, being in Berlin, you, you kind of, or in a big city, it's like being lucky. If you're mm -hmm. in somewhere in, uh, in, the, in the countryside, uh, you probably, uh, you know, you have to, to, uh, tin cans and a wire in the middle, that's it. Thank you. That just gives you a flavour. Um, uh, there are, there are, you know, many, many uh, different perspectives, and we held um, a, a, a number of these deliberative exercises with with the citizens um, before each of the expert working groups coming together. So they were able to really dig deep into what people were saying. So we took some of those concerns and then basically worked with experts to actually formulate responses uh, uh, around some of the uh, issues that were raised and some of the kind of both opportunities um, and challenges for for the people that we we could uh, engaged in in that exercise so but there's more in the report there's an annex that sets out in more detail uh, what citizens uh, uh, through these deliberative exercises were as communicated on each of the three elements of being a successful Europe, a resilient Europe, a greener Europe, because that's how we worked it. And that's the ecology we followed. So you can read more about what people said. I now want to turn to um, uh, Ben, our, our, our key collaborator uh, from Vodafone. Ben, chief economist um, at Vodafone, but also a global head of public affairs. Ben, you've been on the journey with us. Thank you for partnering with us. It's been, it's been good. It's been a rough ride insofar as is we did a lot in a short period of time, but it was amazing how much ground we covered and the kind of engagement we had both from citizens, but also experts and stakeholders. From your perspective, what are the kind of, what's your big takeaways? What are the key insights from you um, as a, you know, as a, a, a telecommunications operator? What, what do you see? What do you take out from the report? 
Yes, uh, thank you, Damendra, um, friends of Europe, for hosting this event. Firstly, I just want to say, before going to the report, how great it is to be here today. Um, last year, this was a, a virtual setting. Um, we talk about the digital transition. I actually quite like the hybrid um, approach, where some are in the room and some are dialing in from elsewhere. So I think that's going to be a trend we see continuing for years to come. Um, it, it's very, um, I think, meaningful for me to go after some of the citizen voices um, that we just heard, because to, to be perfectly honest with everyone in the room, this was an experiment for us. Now, as a large corporate, a European corporate that tends to think about itself, you know, lifting our head up and saying, actually, what are other people saying? What are the citizens saying about the, the transition that we're on? And hearing their voices was a really important part of the, the program that we've run with you, Domendra, for, for the last year. And linking it to, the, to both what Laura and Salvador said, the, the, the importance of funding is, is obviously very present. Um, and the Recovery and Resilience Facility is a major new initiative which got put together in, in an amazingly fast time, let's, let's recognise that achievement, um, to solve some of the gaps the law referred to earlier. Um, but what for me is really important to then bring together to what we've done is, is this consistent with what the citizens were saying? So it's, this, it's called the next generation EU, or at least it was, for, for, I think it still is, um, and the next generation is going to pay for this to some extent. So it's important they are on the journey with us. And I want to put the insights from the report. Lindsay you know, summarised the report so eloquently, far more eloquently than I could. Um, but let me just put a few of the insights um, into the context of what the citizens were saying, what I took away personally from that. Um, firstly, at the, the sort of, not in the individual insights, at the total level, I think, Demendra, you referred to it. it is not a, digital is not a force for unequivocal good. That came through very strongly in, in the focus groups, in the citizens' discussions. And that's something we have to recognise as a major player in the digital space. It's really important to remember all the time we have to have this transition, which we are all on, the journey we're all on. We have to bear in mind it has to be the force for good that citizens expect. And so with Insight 1, the, the, the twin green and digital transition, um, I think, so for us, when, when we hear von der Leyen, especially very early on in the crisis, there's two transitions, digital and green, um, it, it resonates strongly, but the linking them together is only possible, in my view, when our own house is in order. We know that digital has a green, you know, a carbon footprint. So it's, it was really important that citizens can see the benefit of digital and green in combination. And, and hopefully, I like to think that we contributed to that um, through our own commitment to be net zero 10 years earlier than we actually anticipated um, during the course of the pandemic. So uh, for me, that was the first insight. We can make these two transitions combine, but we have to have our house in order, and we like to think we've done that. Um, the, the second one, which I all think was fascinating, was the, the idea of no one being left behind. Now, it sounds obvious, but remember, the people who are voicing this opinion were the people who were by definition not left behind because they were participating online and were able to access digital focus groups. And yet these people are still sufficiently concerned, concerned about those that are left behind to make this one of the fundamental insights into the study. And I think that's, that's exceptionally powerful, both in terms of what was happening during the course of the pandemic, where obviously connectivity was key, but also to bear in mind as we move forward into to the next stage of the recovery phase, where it's not just about people not being left behind, but we need to ensure businesses, especially SMEs, SOHOs are able to benefit from the digitalization journey. The third insight was something I, I, I found a little bit, um, shall I say, upsetting, disturbing about the, some of the comments coming out of the focus groups, was the attitude towards their own personal data. I found it very strong that there, there was an element of resignation, that control was lost, that it was just giving up. There's no, there was no point even trying to think about whether their personal data was indeed personal to them. And the insight for me from this is we cannot let this happen to industrial data. Going forward, the, the, the value of the European economy fundamentally depends on the value we get from industrial data. And if all that value is extracted outside of Europe, um, then Europe has a major economic problem to deal with. And that's really a key insight. We have to be careful about how, how the industrial data is used. And then finally, that the fourth one, which goes back to the, to the earlier point about um, not the unequivocal good force for good, um, is, is around the trust. We have to build trust in digital. That, that requires companies like ourselves, it requires institutions, um, everyone to work collaboratively to ensure there is trust in that. Um, education, investment in cyber security especially. Um, we, we all, I think, saw what happened, uh, was it last week, when a certain service went down for a number of hours? You, know, you have to have the, the belief that the, the, the tools and the services that we fundamentally rely on are there, they're available, they're secure, and um, that they are not subject to, to downtime. Um, so for me, the, it was a, really important to get that citizen debate uh, going, to listen to the views, and to, to get to the conclusion that actually their concerns are our concerns, and the direction we want to go in is the direction they want to go in, and now we have to just make it all happen. 
Thank you. What, and I'm going to keep with you for a moment because I, I want to turn to Roberta, uh, who I know I may have to leave, but I hope that you're able to stay in, in a little while. Uh, uh, but, but before I do go move to you, Roberta, uh, what, you're a global tele telecommunications operator, right? And you have, uh, you're in you know, many, many significant markets. What do you need from the EU and member states to not only accelerate uh, this, you know, what we are referring to as a green digital transition, but to create the right environment for competition as well, but an enabling competition that's a force for social good, not necessarily, you know, a, a zero-sum game on profit. Yes, well, first, let me just rephrase slightly. Firstly, not what we, what we need from institutions, but it's about partnership. Okay. Um, and I want to go back to one of the comments we said earlier on the, um, the, the focus groups about the, if you're in a rural area, maybe your connectivity is two tin cans and a wire, uh, which is quite an extreme and hopefully not, not a, a real life scenario too often. Um, but but it, that is an example of where partnership is, is required. I mean, Laura referred earlier to, Laura, Laura, apologies if I can pronounce the name incorrectly, um, the, the funding gap in relation to the 2025 targets of um, 250 billion euros, which, by the way, the 2030 targets are much more ambitious. So uh, once the, the, the gap is calculated again, we'll, we'll see how big the, that is. And that's where partnership is needed. We, we, we as a provider of digital infrastructure, one could say, well, isn't it our fault that there's only two tin cans in a while? But the, the reality is that the environment for investment in, in Europe does not allow us to go to every house, every farm um, that we would like to. So that's where partnership is necessary. The funds is a great step change in how we can do this, but much, much more is needed also in terms of the, the, the policy environment. But then in terms of your question about competition, this is where I go back a little bit to the data point. It, what we're trying to imagine in the future is this very buoyant ecosystem around industrial data. And an ecosystem but, you know, it can be a source of immense competitive um, pressure and therefore provide a great benefit to, to those that are users of the ecosystem. But that's why we need to make sure that we don't get into um, areas of the ecosystem which are truly dominated and therefore not subject to competition. And we believe we, we play in that, that's, that role, which is a sweet spot where we are um, always bound by competition because we, we, we never act alone, um, but also trying to drive the sector forward with the digitalization um, that we bring. And the competition I mean, is not just around how we compete within the digital ecosystem, but it's how we enable others to be competitive in a broader economy. And here I want to just make a point about SMEs, I, I referred to it earlier. This is a really, really important um, point in time for Europe to, to get SMEs digitalized, and Salvador will know very well in Spain, there's a very positive initiative about, about that. And I'm sure it'll be copied in other places in Europe, especially where the, the funding is available. This is the chance to allow SMEs to, to accelerate their own growth. Um, and, and to compete and be, be those um, new um, huge um, companies that, that we want from our, our European industrial base. So what, what I really think, for, what, what, not what we want from the institutions, what we want to work together with the institutions is to create that enabling environment where others can flourish. Um, and the, the last thing I say is the, the really critical thing from the institutions is to recognize the critical nature of getting this done fast. Mm -hmm. Because we're talking about digital decade You'll hear it repeatedly in this city for, for many months and years to come. But we set ourselves target for 2030, which we think is, is fantastic. But we can't start meeting those targets in 2027. We need to monitor it every step of the way, make sure we're on target. Because if, we don't, if we're not there by 20, or half, more than halfway there by 2025, the other regions in the world will have taken us over. So that's what we want from the institutions, the sense of urgency that the, the funding gaps need to be closed, the, the path to digitalization needs to be accelerated, and then we'll have a very prosperous and successful Europe at the end of it. Ben, thank you. And I, you know, that, that point, the last point you make is, is extremely well made, not simply about uh, leading the race, but it's more a case of, you know, the, in terms of the level of unpredictability of crisis that's ahead of us, we've seen that just in the past 12 months and the 24 months for COVID, but since then, many others. There's something about the fact that being resilient and proactive requires a digital infrastructure that enables it to ensure that children and young people don't go without education for another year should we have another crisis next year. So the urgency is not simply about competition, but actually about there's a kind of a, a humanitarian human rights issue here to a certain extent, which uh, I'm not pressing you. I'm just saying there is something there about Europe getting its act together. So young people and children do not lose um, access to, uh, uh, you know, life changing experiences, which is such as education, uh, again, in the way that they have so far. But thank you very much. Roberta, I'm going to turn to you. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, let's cut to the chase. 
um, you have a very significant role um, in, in the parliament. And I want to ask you, how do you plan to ensure that the RFF, which is one of the largest uses of public taxpayers' money, right, in, in, its history, in the history of Europe, um, will lead to greater accountability of member states, right? So how do you plan to ensure that that happens, greater accountability in member states, but also, and this is significant, meaningful citizen engagement? Not just consultation and citizen panel here and there, you know, good for three months before, you know, the next elections, but something that actually is sustainable. Tough question, I know, Roberta, but over to you. Well, I was going to start by referring to the digital decade, so I won't do that. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll shift. Sorry, I mean, I just wanted to cut to the chair. Thank you. No, no, thank you for, um, for, for having me here. Uh, I, I, I'll start with, with the political background and mm. the fact that, uh, you know, we have sort of come around the, the idea that re recovery is the collective word uh, that we will have to uh, use this year uh, when we look at uh, the defining moment, and if somebody had asked me a year, year and a half ago when the pandemic hit, uh, whether we would have such a quick agreement on the Recovery and Resilience Fund, I would have had my doubts. Uh, in a time when the parliament shut down, the world shut down, and we realized that we needed to do something uh, in, a, in, in a continent which was completely unprepared, uh, not only with the tangible resources or human resources, but also uh, with how to invest uh, or, or source the capital that we've had to source and that we will be and our children will be uh, paying for decades to come. And I think the political departing point was that uh, if we understand that we are all in this together, then the only way we can get out of it is together. Uh, irrespective of which country you come from, irrespective of how big or small a village uh, or town you live in. Uh, and I think that that uh, going forward will shift our economic perspectives and our economic landscape, because this is also not only the biggest and the broadest amount of money that was ever allocated in the monetary sense, it's also the biggest and broadest in the political sense. And this idea that if you are um, a small business in, in Lisbon and a self-employed person in, in, in Stockholm, then you are facing similar challenges and that we in the European Parliament needed to find a solution that would benefit both. So where we are at today is that we are slowly emerging from this very, very long and unprecedented crisis. Uh, and how are we going to con transform it into an opportunity? And negotiating where that money will go and how that money will be used uh, by governments uh, to ensure that the right projects uh, are met uh, with the right amount of uh, green investment, but digital investment as well, where each plan has to contribute at least 20% uh, to digital actions. Uh, in, my, in our mind, this is exactly the EU uh, putting, your, putting our money where our mouth is. Uh, and we are uh, addressing this, this challenge, also making sure that our value system remains intact. A big challenge, big challenge uh, across the European Union. We also need to make sure uh, that both standards, as we've just heard, for the online and offline world uh, are met in a scenario where the applicable digital legislation is, I think, decades old uh, and needs to be completely uh, restructured and remet with the challenges that I, if I can go through them as we are examining them, for example, how to protect our consumers, keeping them safe, not only about uh, talking ab about privacy and how they they, they understand that privacy. Uh, at the moment in the Parliament, we're talking about how we use the, the, the COVID certificate, for example, and is that data stored or not? A big debate, big debate uh, in, uh, in, in an area where, 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 where opinions vary differently, very, very, very much. Where you restore competition and make sure that you have a level playing field in the digital market. Different opinions depending on uh, where you live and what country you come from how you define a fair scope for the new rules. What are the gatekeepers? Who are the gatekeepers? Where are the gatekeepers? Uh, making sure that Europe remains competitive, making sure that governments are trustworthy, that all uh, EU countries enjoy equivalent governance and enforcement. Uh, does it help some governments to make sure that business cannot strive or that so many hurdles are placed on innovation 
and smaller businesses, and ultimately protecting fundamental rights, uh, especially freedom of expression and freedom to conduct a business. So I gave you a little bit of a snapshot of the discussions that we're having. Uh, a lot of work uh, has, has resumed quite intensively also uh, in the Parliament in a, in a physical setting. Uh, we're also uh, talking uh, from uh, with, with the fifth for 55 package uh, that sort of interlinks with what the citizens want. So we came to this parliament in 2019 with the, the vast majority of voters in the EU having placed the economy and the environment at the very top of their concerns, besides migration, important to keep in mind. Uh, and therefore, uh, we need to make sure that this pandemic uh, will, will not, uh, uh, let's say, give us the excuse to prolong it for as long as possible so that the election in 2024 is on our doorstep. And as you said, we're once again asking for people's votes without having delivered on their main concerns and on their main challenges. So uh, if, if I can wrap up, and I'm sure you're going to press me on one of the points I made. So you know I, I am. I, I know you are. So I'm going to say, let's look at our, uh, when, when we talk about the environment, we've spent too long talking about it as though it were in a silo when compared to the economy. Uh, when you see how governments work, where authorities work, uh, they are completely distinct. Uh, and I think uh, the concept of circular economy moving from really not having either the economy or the environment mutually exclusive in the way we build uh, our vision within the context of the funds that are being passed on uh, to governments and organisations in order to make sure that we meet the targets uh, in, uh, uh, in this decade uh, and not in this century. Thank you. So, Roberta, you know you've experienced me working with me in the past as a European young leader. So I'm going to go for it. You haven't answered my question. I want to know, right, and you can say it's not there because I can imagine because people have been saying that, you know, there hasn't been a rule book for this. People are, you know, making, uh, not making it up, but sometimes they are, but they're having to do the right thing with responsibility uh, and, you know, and, and a public social good in mind. But, you know, as I repeat, the largest use of public taxpayers' money. Everyone's been concerned that civil society hasn't been that engaged in the plans that have been developed at member state level. Some have rushed it, some have ducked it, some have not even been bothered. Um, and so, you know, there's a difference. There's now, we've noticed, you know, since the last elections, there's a different power base within the parliament. And you, you can feel it in terms of your ability, your agility, and acting as a counterweight and a counterbalance to the power uh, around the European Commission, uh, uh, etc. What specifically are you planning to do? You know, are you going to create some sort of structure? Because you know that, you know, uh, Geert Kupman, Jan Kupman was here, that, you know, they're looking at all the plans, okay? So where they're assessing a mechanism against a grid of what, what they're doing in terms of percentages and programs. What kind of dashboard or navigating system are you going to put into place so that we can trust you to do the right thing? And I, I don't mean that in a personal way, but, you know, as a politician and as a, from the parliament. No, oh, actually, thank you for, for pressing me on this. You are right that the consultation process in different countries varied immensely. Uh, because whereas the Parliament consulted relatively widely, relatively, and I use that uh, uh, carefully, uh, with identifying where we wanted uh, the focus to be, digital, green, children, that was a parliament, pro, parliament um, uh, push. Mental health, loneliness, poverty, exclusion. Um, that girl who was interviewed earlier, you know, I spent all my day at mm. the computer. I have four children. Uh, they have, you know, they still can't get back to being in school properly. Uh, and they sort of are happy if they're put in quarantine. I mean, this is the reality. I have teenagers at home. Uh, so uh, there we consulted quite widely at that point. But what happened is, that not all governments decided to consult their national parliament with the draft plans. Some did openly, some governments actually collapsed because of that, but others simply washed over, ignored completely. Uh, and that's where our concern is. And when we saw that happening, uh, especially in those countries where we were concerned with the way certain things were already being done, pre-pandemic, during the pandemic, um, one of the things that scared me the most when I uh, um, observed the, in, the instinct of countries as soon as the pandemic hit, close the border, close it. We've been decades trying to open, close it immediately, physically. And I realized immediately that that in instinct is so, such an easy one 
to start to look inwards, that all these big words would not have mattered in the time. So we were concerned about that and we set up a very, very solid uh, group uh, that is going through each and every action plan, na national okay. action plan, each and every budget line, asking the questions to the Commission to make sure that every time the Commission President um, goes to a country and physically hands over the plan, you've seen that, that mediatic, um, I think, very successful campaign, uh, but we have looked at that before. Okay. She did that. And we are going to continue to do that because that's where, actually, you talked about the power political shift. I think we have seen that the Parliament can do a lot and the citizens ask us to do a lot. Uh, and when we talk about rule of law, it's not only about, you know, political decisions or, or judicial decisions that we look into, but also ultimately when we have taken, and it's us, it's on our shoulders, the decision uh, to commit such an unprecedented amount of money, uh, I need to give answers. Mm. And this is not in two and a half years when the elections are, are back, but in five, ten years, we're still going to be discussing this amount. And finally, what I also think is our big challenge is that we will slowly emerge from this and forget. Forget. So that we are no way pandemic ready, no way are we crisis ready, and we're not even like moving towards seeing whether our treaties, okay, in the Conference on the Future of Europe, there is there's movement now, but whether our treaties and the competences of the European Union, uh, in, in which, for example, in the area of health, could even be, be looked at uh, and, and, and moved into, into something the way governments actually, from experience now, and not hypothetically, can um, look to the EU to provide a solution uh, across our borders. Thank you. And thank you for being passionate in response to my... Uh, well, I wasn't too provocative. I think it was an important one for you to answer. You've done worse, huh? So <laughs> okay, thank you. That's good to know. Me. That's good to know. But finally, before you, before you rush off, and, and this is the thing that we've been banging on about for some time, and you know this, Roberta, is data sharing. We know that one of the, one of the things that the crisis uh, just you know, enhanced, if you like, is the uh, issue of data sharing, the absence of trust amongst member states and institutions and uh, uh, corporates to actually share information that's essential to policy making, improving policy making uh, and managing a crisis. I mean, there is a sense that the Conference on the Future of Europe and, uh, is probably a dead duck, but I don't know. I don't know about that. It's felt as if it's taken a long time, and um, it, I don't know whether it will produce the results that everyone wishes it to produce. So that's not a, 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 an offensive remark to anyone who's in charge of it, but it's just taken so long and we don't know where it's going. Do you see that there's kind of this, that, uh, do you think it's realistic to imagine uh, an EU-wide data sharing framework uh, emerging in the next year? Well, let's call it a duckling, right? Okay. Uh, it, and it is, it, it is still uh, in existence because of the parliament. Let's, let's, uh, uh, we have a very um, a good leadership of the conference um, uh, with, with all the political groups, uh, but also Giver Hofstadt at the helm. Also from the commission, Dubravka Suica is, is very active. Uh, and uh, and uh, we, are, we are quite a few of us who remember the previous conference. Uh, and we were younger, but uh, we, we haven't forgotten the pain yes. that we went through and the more painful follow-up to it, uh, where we had to completely restart. Uh, and by then I had moved to the council and I was the lawyer for my country actually negotiating something that I had done as a, as a youth politician two years earlier. Mm. And, and I really don't think that we deserve or we even can justify going through that mm. again. But the discussion is there, and with regards to data, I would encourage Ben uh, and your uh, and, and colleagues uh, um, uh, that work in the same field to put us on the spot there. That we actually uh, talk in broad terms about data sharing, sometimes from a security perspective. Yeah. Uh, but we forget that this is ultimately a force for good that can be abused rather than the opposite. Uh, at the moment, you know, we're, we're just discussing the Digital Services Act and, uh, and um, um, a different part of the digitalization platforms. Uh, and I come from the European People's Party group and it, there's a lot of enthusiasm there. Uh, but a lot more needs to be done because, you, you, as we said, you cannot forget the values on which we are based and the ethics side of it. But we cannot allow 
progress to happen outside Europe for us to become solely dependent because we've lost the research, the intelligence, or even the willpower to be competitive on, on a global scale. Uh, and in this area, uh, we would be, let's say, we would be committing a mistake if we did not look at our partners in the private sector and see uh, the investment that's being made and match it with, a, with public sector aspirations. Good to know. I hope because everyone's tweeting this. You know, there you go. A message from a senior politician. From me, from me, just me. <laughs> no, but it's great. No, but it's important. It's, 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 it's also, a, a, you know, a character of the kind of uh, uh, generation of politician you are, you know, and, and that you're able to say in these terms the way you, which we wouldn't imagine from uh, other generation potentially. But it's good that you said that and also the challenge to the private sector. I think, you know, you can see that there is a private sector alliance uh, that's emerged. And I just hope that those of you who are related to it, listen to that message and actually bang on bang on Roberta's door and her fellow parliament parliamentarians and say this is what you can do and this is the investment required and let's have an open public debate about it. so thank you very much so colleagues I'm going to open it up to uh, those of you I don't know that you may need to leave so don't worry Roberta uh, who would like to participate engage I'm looking at you because you've been um, I know I'm picking on you uh, deliberately, because Estonia is a path, you know, pathfinder in Europe. It's been described as one of the most digital countries in Europe. Um, what's your take on what you've heard so far in terms of where we, you know, you're always being uh, cast aside as saying, yeah, actually, you're really small. That's why you'll be able to do what you do in Estonia uh, in terms of the digital, uh, uh, you know, infrastructure you've created. I know that that's not the case. It cannot be the case, having, you know, earned my heels in Scotland, where people, the same, same thing was alluded to the Scots. But share with us some of your views on what you've heard so far. Uh, OK, thank you very much. Um, indeed. Uh, Please introduce yourself again. I'm sorry. Glenn Yarrett. I'm... Uh, uh, Prime Minister, Estonia's Prime Minister, EU advisor. I actually have a degree in digital transformation, so uh, I have used to do the first ever uh, Prime Minister's meeting on, uh, on Talent Digital Summit in, during the Estonian presidency, so this is where we also launched. But I think there are some of the things, it's not only about technology, it's also about the way we think about it. So, so the first wrong way to think about it is that Estonia can do it because it is Estonia and the rest you cannot. You can, I mean, uh, it, it will be at your own peril if you don't. Um, some of the myths have to be uh, told differently. Henry Ford used to say that uh, if I asked people what they want, they would have said faster horses. So, um, so also, I mean, sitting here and thinking and hearing what people say, uh, we have an existential crisis and we deliver in 2037. We have a digital revolution and we deliver in 2052. What? I mean, are, are, we, are we feeling, are we, are we having the sense of urgency? So I'm, I'm with you, Ben, on this. And actually the example also is with telecoms. Um, uh, so I, I, I will not pick on people. But we had meetings on two telecoms packages. I think this is already 10 years ago, something like that. All telcos we met were against it completely against it. It will kill business model, it will kill telecommunication, it will kill everything that we have in Europe. And the result is completely the opposite. The data, the amount of data that now crosses borders, the people have the ability to roam like home, etc., etc. We are far ahead of all other continents in rolling out some of the infrastructure and, and using this, this opportunity. But I've been sitting in two meetings at least with all Estonian telecom operators listening that this will kill it all. So sometimes we also need to lead, not only to listen on, <clears throat> on this. Uh, the other big myth on, on ICT is, um, is it's a sector. It's not a sector, it's a technology. If you are in agriculture and you're not doing it, you will, you will, your business will be killed in 10 years, or it will be Google in 10 years. It can be either or. But if you're not dealing with it in agriculture yet, do. Do it fast. And so every minister or every commissioner is also a digital commissioner. Every minister or a commissioner is also a green commissioner. So, so it is also the way we think about technology. Estonia achieved some of its successes not because we were a tech country, so that we had a lot of technology. No, we were poor, but, um, but we needed to offer the same public services like Italy does. But we are 1.3 million people, so how do you do it? Technology is an efficiency technology. It will make stuff effective. 
So Estonian government at the moment is 24-7, so we don't close our doors. You can visit the Estonian government 24-7. We will vote internet vote this weekend. Uh, first time 16-year-old people can also internet vote. So, and we are the only country that does internet voting. Not e-voting, but internet voting. I can vote from here. And I can change a vote within one week. Several times, vote as much as I like, and there will be a closing uh, date. So, so we can do this, and we have done this now 15 years, and no one else has replicated it. Why? I don't, I don't really understand. It is the way we think about um, stuff. Um, of course, citizen-centric stuff is, is there. Digital technology will make the dirty, dull, and dumb jobs go. So there is an upside for people not doing the dirty, dull, and dangerous jobs anymore. Of course, there will be something else that comes instead. So we will have to be imaginative in, in, in providing that opportunity, but this technology will allow this to happen. So we should embrace it um, at full speed. Where I am a little bit worried is that, again, the sense of urgency. I, I actually like the digital compass. We worked with uh, Angela Merkel and wrote a full prime minister letter about it. Is that um, the Moore's law, you know what the Moore's law is. It is that the computing power in ev it doubles every two years. Until the Moore's law works, we should remove barriers in using this technology and in regulatory framework, regulate after, not before. Allow it to happen. And then we need also technology push. Otherwise, we will end up a society that looks like Facebook or looks like WeChat. So unless we provide a democratic technology that reflects the values, our people will choose WeChat and Facebook. Do you feel often at, at the street that a society feels a little bit already like a Facebook chat? You know, we scream at each other more often and often and often. So there is another law that works in internet, is the Conway's law. Technology will reflect the communication infrastructure that we have. Mm. And communication infrastructure will reflect the society that we have. So if, if we want Facebook, we will get Facebook. So if we don't deliver uh, a communication infrastructure that reflects the values, then there will be no democratic communication architecture. So, um, so this is where the real big worry is. Thank you. See, that's why I bring you in. Look, isn't that brilliant? Thank goodness for you. No, uh, and you know, you have some very important messages. And colleagues, I have about five of you who want to come in. And I've, as you can see, the, you know, the person that keeps on coming down here, spending me notes, saying, absolutely not. I've got to finish at, I've got one minute. So I'm sorry. I'm, no, 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 no. I, I thought I had more time to play with, but you know, I've been uh, consistently delayed, uh, over, overstretching our time. Uh, and you know, you're gonna miss some tea and coffee. There's only a short break. So I can't take you. I'm so, so sorry. I, but I will privilege our online community just for one, if I may, if you can be literally 60 seconds, Joe. Okay, um, I'll, go, I'll bring in uh, Andreas Schall from the OECD. You've got 60 seconds to, to make your contribution, Andreas. Thanks so much, and uh, thanks to Friends of Europe for organizing this passionate debate, even if I have only one minute. Uh, let me come in from the people-centered approach. Uh, jobs and employment. First Avenue, 13% of the jobs might be automated, 32% uh, uh, have to change. So this means uh, that we need to make this often quoted lifelong learning a reality. Vocational training should not be only at the beginning of your professional career, but needs to continue for all the professional life. And our study shows and it's not only about technology and cognitive skills. We also need to invest in social and in emotional skills because people will need to work more and more in teams, uh, using more and more self-responsibility. And also for these jobs who are, will be falling away, we need to have an answer to empower the people to do it on, on, on their self, maybe become self-employed going forward. This brings me to the second avenue, education. There is a lot of discussion which we fully subscribe on on about uh, you know, infrastructure, bringing the broadband to the people, having our kids uh, equipped with uh, computers, notebooks, and iPads. But we also need to look at the substance in this business in education. We need to invest in the curricula of the teacher, and we need to discuss what our kids, what our people should learn in terms of content and substance. And this, is, this will make the difference of uh, the good old continent Europe bringing the culture we have and the society, the, the imagination we have uh, to really shape the, this development. Thank you very much indeed. Hope this was 60 seconds. Just about. 
and I'd, I'd urge you to read the report uh, if you, when you get a chance, because that notion, one of the key recommendations is also about anytime, anywhere education and creating the infrastructure for that across Europe on an end-to-end -end basis. I am so sorry, because I'm looking at them thinking, can I have more time? And they're saying, and I think, no, no, okay, no, I'm really sorry. So I'm going to have to close it down. And I, I do apologize to the four or five of you. Uh, feel free to grab anybody around this room in terms of that uh, conversation or the issue you want to raise. But firstly, say thank you to all. Thank you all very much for being here and our online and uh, uh, obviously Zoom as well as live stream audience. Thank you all for uh, participating in this in this very crunchy, uh, deep debate. It's not going to go away, but I hope that this report, uh, the, this ecology of approach we've taken, uh, which is to create this ecology of citizen expert public sector and wider public debate is one that you will also think is worthwhile in adopting as we move forward. So um, let's hope that some of this has traction in the policy community uh, and the private sector community as well. But I think, you know, uh, it was a powerful call to action from Roberta to the private sector, which I hope is built on in terms of uh, how we can move the data sharing uh, needle in the right direction. But thank you all very much. Go and have your cup of tea and coffee. And we're back in here for a big session on the future of foreign policy. So you're back in here, but a very crunchy debate on the future of foreign policy. It's downstairs in the library. Forget, I don't even know what I'm talking about. It's downstairs in the library, future of foreign policy. Okay, thank you all very much.